parallel array of stained glass treasures um, up and down the country. And we're going to explore this in two parts, as Peter suggested. Today, we're going to look at some of the earliest examples of stained glass in England's parish churches, right up to the Reformation. And then next week, we will pick up um, in the post-Reformation period. But first, I thought it might be helpful um, to answer a few key questions. And the first is one that, you know, people are often a bit confused about, actually. What is stained glass? Um, the pictures that I'm showing you here are all different types of stained glass, painted glass. Um, and we call stained glass as an umbrella term. So every single one of these pieces um, is stained glass, although the term is a bit mis misleading. All of these panels have glass as their main base material. Some have lead, which hold them together, and most, but not all, also have some painted detail, and some also have some colour stains applied to the glass. Um, we will break that down a little bit, but just to give you that kind of first impression that the term can be used to describe uh, what sometimes looks like a, a quite disparate group of uh, images of, of windows. And also it's quite helpful to have a slight introduction to how stained glass is made. Now the stained glass artist will actually purchase the raw glass material from the glass blower. So the glass blowing takes place uh, separately. And I often get asked, how is sheet glass blown? And I hope that this slide uh, demonstrates a couple of those techniques. Um, we have the glass blower who picks up the molten gather of glass on his rod. Glass, of course, being heated up sand and ash to a very high temperature. And with the glass blower's rod, um, he can blow and spin the pipe um, to get this crown glass at the top there, which is a centrifugal force which forces the, the spinning of the glass into a spun disc called a crown disc. Or the cylinder glass method, which in the picture below, you will see the glass blower blows and swings his pipe to produce this molten gather of glass. Um, it's blown into a cylinder shape and then the cylinder is scored right down the middle and opened up um, into the heat into a sheet. And you can see that process happening in present day here at English Antique Glass. Um, so this is how flat sheet glass is formed from blowing glass. And you will see that the sheets here are also um, colour. Uh, we've got some blue cylinders here. And that's because the glass is mostly coloured whilst it's being made. The addition of metallic oxides, metal compounds, into the glass mix under that very hot temperature causes the coloration of the glass. So cobalt was sometimes used for blue. Um, a gold was sometimes used for a pink ruby colour. So the glass artist, the stained glass artist, will use his coloured sheets of glass. That's the raw material for the stained glass window making process, but the glass blowing happens separately. So we'll just walk you through the, the next couple of steps. Most art forms start with a drawing and stained glass is, is no different. And crucially, you need a one-to-one -one scale cartoon drawing for your window to be made from. And you can see here that on the left, and you will then take your piece of glass and cut it to the right shapes. Here, you can see that um, in the medieval period, quite primitive cutting tools were used. This is a hot iron, which would have been heated up into the fire and used to score the glass so that it broke. Um, and then you can use this nibbling tool at the bottom, which is called a grosing iron, to cut away the edges and get that shape a bit cleaner. Nowadays, of course, we have all sorts of wheel cutters, which are much easier to, to use. But this is how glass was cut in the medieval period. When your pieces of glass are cut, you will assemble them back onto the drawing. And this is where, if you're adding paint to the window, you will start to paint on the glass. And you can see that this 
shape that's been cut is actually a leaf and it's the paint that's applied to the top of that glass that makes it look like a leaf. And the paint is very important. It gives a lot of the detail to stained glass that we see. The paint mix is an iron or copper oxide mixed with ground up glass um, and into, made into a wet paint mix by the addition of gum arabic today. Or in the medieval period, um, they would actually use red wine or urine to mix up their wet paint. So, so very pleasant. The paint paints onto the glass very freely and it's only fixed to the glass when it's fired in the kiln at a very high temperature around 650 degrees centigrade. And if you remember that paint has ground up glass in its mix. So when it's fired in the kiln, the paint fuses to the glass surface. So painting on glass, very important. And you can see in those faces on the right that you can build up layers of paint in, in glass to get some shading, some stippling. Um, and there's also this yellow color, which is a silver stain. And this is where the term stained glass comes from, although not all glass is uh, technically stained. And this is a silver compound, a silver nitrate, which when applied to glass and then fired in the kiln, stains the clear glass a yellow colour and you'll see it a lot on many of the images I'm going to show you. So once the glass has been painted in its individual pieces, fired in the kiln, it's brought out of the kiln again and laid onto that cartoon for leading up and most glass windows are held together with lead and um, lead is cast or milled into this H section that you can see or, or actually more accurately like a capital I with two grooves on either side that the glass fits very neatly into. Um, lead is bendy so you can bend it around each piece and then the joints where those lead lines meet are soldered to form a panel and finally the gaps are cemented and, and sealed um, and that panel is then ready to go into a window, um, probably a wooden or metal frame within the stonework. So I appreciate that was a whirlwind introduction to techniques, but these techniques haven't really changed um, over the course of history that much, although new techniques have appeared. So understanding this process will help us to appreciate the artistry and the craftsmanship that goes into making stained glass. Now the precise origins of stained glass um, are unknown. Um, glass was probably employed in the Byzantine period and in the Roman period in windows, um, but in England the earliest oldest coloured glass known to have formed part of a window is actually Anglo-Saxon and I'm showing you here um, this little circular panel at St Paul's Church in Jarrow, Northumbria. Um, now, this was actually the site of a, a twin monastery, um, one at Jarrow, one at Wehrmuth, so two Anglo-Saxon monasteries. And these pieces of glass, which you can see are all unpainted, were actually excavated from the ground. So this roundel is not how it would have appeared in the Anglo-Saxon period, but the pieces of glass are thought to have been Anglo-Saxon window glass used in stained glass windows. And you can see there's a variety of colours there. And examples of Anglo-Saxon glass have been discovered at various sites across England, so it's quite clear that during this period um, stained glass started to be embraced during the, the Christianisation of Anglo-Saxon England. And the art of stained glass was practiced widely in the later medieval period to great effect. And even though we've had uh, major historic and political events such as the Reformation and the Civil War, um, which caused deliberate damage to stained glass, we have enough fragments and occasional complete windows and schemes to give us a fairly good idea of the ways in which stained glass windows contributed to the medieval church and to society at, la at large. So we're going to look at some of these and think about stained glass as um, a decorative art form, as a devotional art form, as an art form that contributes to the liturgy, uh, the worship within the church, and also as an art form that commemorates 
instructs and um, boasts about uh, people's status, so a, a status symbol as well. Now most of the surviving medieval glass it is actually in England and Wales. There's barely any in Scotland and Ireland, um, so I'm focusing on England today. Um, and actually, there's hardly anything in England uh, that was made in England that predates the late 12th century. So one of the, the earliest examples of painted stained glass in situ, that's thought to be in its original context, is in the parish church of All Saints in Dalbury, Derbyshire. And the painted details here, you can see, reveal the features of the face of Archangel Michael and also the lines uh, indicating the wings which folded above his head and of course the drapery lines on his cloak below. So, so this is thought to be one of the, the earliest stained glass uh, windows to survive in its original situation. It's fairly obvious but good to remember that stained glass has a really important relationship with light and colour. Light is fundamental to viewing stained glass and of course this had a very significant spiritual and symbolic significance within the Christian church. Light was an analogy for the divine, for God himself, and on the first day of creation, light was separated from darkness. And Christ said, I am the light of the world. And stained glass windows with their jeweled light and many colours were reminiscent of the visions of heaven as recorded by John in the book of Revelation. I won't read the passage on this slide here, but you can see from the descriptive words that the heaven is described uh, by John as having walls of stone, of precious glass uh, materials and lots of colours there, um, like to precious jewels. And it's thought that stained glass was seen to resemble, resemble heaven on earth. At the same time, stained glass windows are very practical. They keep the rain and wind out whilst letting light in. This window on the left, um, dating to the early 13th century, is one of the panels we'd, we're delighted to say is on display at the Stained Glass Museum. And not all stained glass is painted, as you can see here. So this is a panel made of glass and lead. It's called a grisaille panel because it's predominantly made of white or clear glass. And you can see an example next to it that's in the parish church at Hastingley in Kent. Um, our panel is slightly better preserved, or at least this is a better photo of it, but you can see here that clear glass does corrode um, over time. So this very old glass has browned in colour, it's slightly greeny um, in, in both examples actually, but you can particularly see that in the Hastingley example here. So glass does corrode slowly over time. There's a, a stunning example of the use of grisaille glass at the parish church in Norbury, Derbyshire. Um, which shows how grisaille glass, this predominantly clear glass, let in a lot more light into the churches. Um, and here in the 14th century, this had a very practical function. It also highlighted the architecture around and flooded the chancel with light. And that's very important because in the chancel at the east end of the church was where the priest would celebrate the, the Mass, the Eucharist, and it's thought that this grisaille glass at the east end would actually make that more visible to the people in the church. So there's a, a deliberate significance there to the choice of glass, thinking about the space and liturgy. White glass was not only more translucent than the coloured glass, um, but it was also cheaper, because if you remember, coloured glass is made using the addition of expensive metals. Now each of the, the side windows at Norbury are also filled with um, almost exclusively clear or white glass, some of which is painted, I hope you can see here in the detail, with some really beautiful scrolling naturalistic leaves or foliage patterns. And this is a, a rare example of a, a fairly complete medieval glazing scheme. Who paid for such glass? Um, that's a good question. And the clue here 
is in the windows themselves, in the shields that you can see in the church. There are various family shields, these heraldic emblems, which you can see set amongst these decorative panels. And it's thought that the Fitz Herbert family, although their arms aren't in the window pictured here, um, paid for the glass and that the glass shows their various ties to important uh, wealthy and powerful families like the de Warrens and the Clares. So it's showing friendships and connections, um, your, your power if you like. There's lots of signs of people making their own marks in um, churches through stained glass and we will see that as we, we go through. Another interesting case of heraldry combined with figural representation can be seen at very famous glass at Tewkesbury Abbey. Uh, this is 14th century glass that actually depicts a number of nobles um, who held the lordship of Tewkesbury and they're all shown as knights dressed in armour and you can see that their armour actually identifies the people. So we have here Gilbert Declare the first or, or the second and Hugh Dispenser the second. The glass was probably paid for Eleanor de Clare, um, who was married to, to these two men um, who depicted, and she, she appears as a donor in one of the other windows. But it's a very interesting um, way of showing these individual portraits. Although, of course, if you look at the faces, these are not individual portraits at all. Um, it's actually the same cartoon, the same drawing that has been used um, over and over, slightly adapted. Um, it's the heraldry that tells you who these people are. And within the many chantry chapels of the, the late medieval parish church, um, windows were set up sometimes to claim ownership of space as well as people's hopes for their salvation. So this is um, the Beecham Chapel, which was um, paid for by Richard Beecham, the Earl of Warwick, who died in 1439. And he actually during his lifetime set up his will to leave money to, to build this chapel and it's effectively a memorial chapel to, to him and his family and you can see his tomb in the centre there but he also specified how the stained glass should appear and he was one of the most wealthy um, men of, of, the, of his time so this is a very lavish chapel much larger than most chantry chapels and the glazier who we know uh, is named because we have a contract for this glass was actually the king's glazier john prud of westminster so he's using the very finest artists and in the glass um, richard beecham appears himself although as you can probably see from this image the head and hands of this figure are certainly not Richard Beecham's. They have been uh, taken from other parts of the window. Um, they have been lost probably during the, the Reformation. But the body, again, shows this very complicated heraldry, um, the badge of Richard Beecham, which you can also see on the left here. Very common for donor figures who pay for their windows to be shown at the bottom of a window kneeling with their hands clasped in prayer just like he is here. Stained glass is often spoke about as the bible of the poor and of course a lot of stained glass in parish churches both in the medieval period and today visualize the bible. Um, they, they tell us the, the bible stories and here you can see two panels um, of depictions of scripture from Genesis, uh, here is Adam and Eve with the serpent green snake body wrapped around the, the tree in the garden of life as Adam and Eve are about to take the, the bite into their apples. And on the right hand side, um, the next sequential scene, which is of course Adam and Eve being cast out from the garden of Eden by the angel. However, you'll see there's also scrolls here, inscriptions in Latin. Um, this panel, these panels are from a window in, in St. Neot's Church in Cornwall. It's very unlikely that everyone who worshipped in the church, all of the local people, could uh, read the Latin. The Latin is there for those who were knowledgeable enough to read, but the images um, would have been identifiable without being able to read the inscriptions. 
there are some wonderfully imaginative interpretations of the Bible in stained glass and amongst my favourites of these are trees of Jesse, the Jesse tree, which um, some of you I'm sure are familiar with. And here is an example from uh, the Margareting Church, uh, I think it's 15th century, um, and this is a really interesting example of uh, an interpretation of a biblical passage which basically shows the genealogical um, lineage of Christ through the Virgin Mary right back to Jesse, father of King David. If you think about your Christmas hymns, born of David's line, that's exactly what this is showing, that Christ is born of the line of David. And Jesse is often shown sleeping or lying at the bottom here with branches that come from his, his stomach and you can see the twisting stems of these branches which form the tree encircling um, each group in this family tree, if you like, this genealogical tree. So some wonderful interpretations of this, which is based on a passage in Isaiah. And I couldn't resist showing you another because this is really uh, quite significant, um, but very rare and unusual. This is a fantastic example at Dorchester Abbey, which you can see the glaziers and the stonemasons cleverly work together here and actually use the stonework of the window, the, the mullions, to carve the branches. So the, the stone becomes the branches of the tree and then the space in the windows in between um, the stained glass is used to show the figures. So it's a wonderful example of how in these buildings, stonemasons and glaziers worked together. Now images of saints were also very prominent in medieval parish churches. Saints were intercessors who provided a communication channel from earth to heaven and could petition for the living and dead. And there was a great cult around the saints, their relics, um, and also many people who were pilgrims um, journeying from, from one place to another. Single figures of saints like these, which again are in the stained glass museum's collection at the moment, although formerly in a parish church, are Saint Catherine and Saint Lawrence, identifiable by the items that they are holding, which here are the symbols of their martyrdom. So Catherine holds the wheel and the sword, uh, Catherine wheel on bonfire night in England, that's where this comes from. Lawrence is holding the rack in which he was um, burnt and, and stretched on. So quite gruesome really, but this is how we identify these saints. And they're shown under these Gothic canopies, which um, not only remind us of the architecture uh, of the medieval parish church, these, these Gothic uh, buildings, but also shrines that were erected at the time. And of course, windows depicting certain saints may have been located near their shrines as well as other art forms. And here I'm showing you um, an illuminated manuscript on the left and uh, an illustration of um, Avalyn de Fors's tomb at Westminster Abbey to show you that these figures under niches are you know, very typical of the Gothic style and are to be found in a variety of medieval art forms. So stained glass is also related to these other medieval art forms. It shouldn't be viewed entirely separately. The choice of saints within stained glass windows often also had a local significance. We're back to St Neot's Church here in Cornwall, which is a, a fantastic place if you're, if you're on holidays down there, do pop in. Um, this window shows the life of St Neot and it references a number of stories associated with this saint who was a monk and a hermit. Now Saint Neot is the patron saint of fish and one of the reasons is a, a story that's associated with him. Legend has it that there was a well nearby that contained three fish and an angel told Saint Neot that as long as he ate no more than one fish a day their number would never decrease. And Saint Neot actually fell ill one time and here, here he is shown in bed ill and his servant has um, went and got him some fish but his servant actually has cooked two fish not the one that the angel instructed 
St Neot was shocked at hearing this and ordered the servant to take the fish back to the well and prayed for forgiveness. And as the servant poured the two fish back in the well, you can perhaps make out that tiny detail there, miraculously they both returned to life. So this window and many others are full of those sorts of stories which are, are captured in uh, the lives and, and legends of saints and would have been very well known by the local people, I'm sure. Of course, St Neots is a fairly rural place and fishing and farming uh, would have been very important. So I'm sure this also had an extra significance to the young men of the parish who actually paid for this window. And a number of members of the local community at St Neots paid for the windows there. Um, and just to show you, here's a, a, a series of windows that were actually are paid for by female donors. The, the sisters and wives of the men of the parish, um, not named, but here they are uh, shown at the bottom as donors. And donors were, were frequently depicted in um, church windows and sometimes these were groups of people um, we have at Ludlow Church which is another fantastic church in Shropshire a number of fine medieval windows and um, this unique one which is uh, the Palmer's window which was paid for by the Palmer's Guild a local guild of pilgrims who actually funded a lot of the, the church building and the, the glass in this chapel, which is uh, St John's Chapel. And we think that they, they used St John's Chapel as their kind of private meeting space. So they adorned it um, and this window actually celebrates the, the legend behind the foundation of their guild. So it's, it's particularly significant. And you can see these pilgrim uh, hats that are that are here in the on the left. Another quite unique example survives at Middleton uh, in Lancashire, where we have um, a seven, seventeen. This is just uh, some of them. Seventeen kneeling named archers, um, who all have their longbows and. Just above the longbows, you may be able to make out there's some writing. Each one is named individually. This is a guild of local archers who went into battle. And it's thought that the window actually um, was put up before they went to battle. Uh, the inscription asks uh, people to pray for them. Um, and they did actually go to battle not long after at Flodden. But fantastic um, to see historic costume and uh, actually weapons here um, in, in a local parish window. Sometimes donors were individuals uh, too, and we have the two examples here of, of rectors of Aldwinkle Church in North Hants, and um, both had given funds towards uh, the, the, the building and they're shown in the tracery lights as donor figures with, with their names around so we, we know who they are. One is Roger Travers and the other William de Lufwick. It's quite unusual for donors to be shown up in the tracery lights, the very high parts of a window. Um, those parts were normally actually reserved for the company of heaven. Um, angels often took the, the tracery lights, sometimes images of God himself or the, the Trinity. And I, I couldn't resist showing you these two wonderful uh, feathered angels, which were uh, very popular in the 15th century. The one on the left is probably from Norfolk and is today at the Stained Glass Museum. And the one on the right um, from Bolton Percy in Yorkshire is still in, in the church there. It's easy for us to forget that medieval England was Catholic and churches looked very different. They were full of colour um, much more than they are today. And stained glass is, was just one aspect of that. So you would have had wall painting, polychrome marble, gilding, painted sculpture. Um, and, and really these, at the church would have felt and looked quite different. Um, think incense, think lots of side chapels and, and perhaps shrines. There was an enormous cult around the Virgin Mary um, in Catholic England and especially from the 14th century onwards. 
this is a really wonderful rare survival of a depiction of the Virgin Mary um, in medieval glass uh, and it's very typical of the English um, international Gothic style, this mid 14th century period. It's at the same glass museum, but um, formerly came from a parish church at Hadzor. Um, and you can see a detail of the Virgin Mary's face there with the dove, um, the Holy Spirit, telling her that she's going to give birth to the Christ child. This is an Annunciation scene. There, there would have been far more images of the Virgin Mary in stained glass that, than survive today. Another one um, that survives, which is, is quite uh, a nice one and, and shows the importance of the Virgin Mary in terms of devotion, is this panel at Ross and Wye in Herefordshire along the Welsh borders there. Um, you can see in the centre Saint Anne, the mother of the Virgin Mary, and the Virgin Mary being taught to read. She's holding an open book. And at the foot of these figures is Bishop Thomas Spofford, who was Bishop of Hereford. Um, and the abbot of, of Mary, St. Mary's York. And he is shown kneeling and offering his heart to the figures. So this is an act of devotion, which is celebrated and recorded in stained glass for all to see. And devotion was very important, of course, in, in the church. This is where people would go and pray and receive uh, the Eucharist communion and the crucifixion was a very common image again often at the east end um, of the church above the celebration of the Eucharist as a reminder of Christ's sacrifice. This is quite a nice contrast of images here because the 14th century image of Christ on the left is, is full of coloured glass um, and some beautiful foliage pattern backgrounds and then on the right it's a, a slightly later 15th century um, medieval window where there's a lot more uh, white light introduced through this white glass, the quarried background. And that was a shift in style. But in both figures, focus is on the suffering of Christ. And you can see from the signings of his body, um, the, the awful uh, torturing of, of his crucified body. Some windows remind us how these churches were used. Um, quite literally, this window shows the seven sacraments of the Catholic Church, which include the celebration of the Eucharist, which is on, on the left there, um, as well as marriage, which I've got a detail on the right. You can see matrimonium, um, the inscription above. Here is a young couple getting married in front of their uh, friends and family. And of course, this is uh, one of the sacraments that still takes place in this parish church. There's wonderful um, continuity, um, probably made by a, a local workshop. This is at Doddis Comley, and the glass is probably made by a workshop in Exeter. Windows were also there for instruction, um, moral instruction, how to act. This representation of the six corporal acts of mercy show charitable acts um, being made by actually, interestingly, the same figure in each panel. And here he is um, in the detail. He's the, the figure with the, the hat and the red and blue cloak um, giving the hungry bread from this basket, the, the figure with the big beard. Um, it may well be the donor who paid for this window, Nicholas Blackburn, who was mayor of the city of York at the time. And this is a 15th century window, which shows how to act, how to be charitable. But of course, he paid for the window. If this is a portrait of him in every single scene doing the acts, it's also a celebration of him as a person. Also windows of how not to act. Um, this is a really, really unique piece um, panel which survives at, at St. Nicholas Church in Stanford and it's a warning against idle gossip. You will see there are three women at the centre, two who are actively engaged in gossiping and one listening in from behind and there's two devils on either side who are uh, clearly encouraging them to gossip. This is a, a bad thing to do and especially at church. Interestingly, we see similar scenes in wall painting. Um, on the left here, you can see the devil bashing these two gossiping women's head together. 
quite um, funny and perhaps surprising images to see, although if you attended Emma Wells's lecture a few weeks ago, perhaps not so surprising anymore. These are the consequences of living an amoral life. And medieval stained glass artists were really imaginative, especially when it came to representing heaven and hell. The ultimate lesson for us all, the day of judgment, which here, um, the very well known last judgment window at St. Mary's Church in Fairford, which is a, a really fantastic window um, with all sorts of glory, uh, gory details. Um, it's glorious glass, but it's gory details. On the right, you have um, people being judged and sent to hell. And I'll show you some details of that in a moment. And on the left, people passing into heaven um, in the company of angels with a golden light all around them. The Fairford Church was a fairly new building paid for in the late um, 15th century, but the glazing actually dates to the early 16th century, first uh, quarter of the, the 16th century, and there are 28 enormous windows in the church, of which this is just one, um, and it was probably glazed by Flemish glaziers who were at the, the height of their, their game and uh, working across England at this time, um, and especially actually for royal patrons. But examples of the, the scheme at Fairford are quite rare. Um, it was actually a scheme which was paid for by a wealthy patron, a, a wool and cloth merchant, John Tame, and overseen after his death by his son, Edmund. So 28 complete windows at the church, um, which have been restored, but actually are really extraordinary examples of early 16th century glass commissioned only a few decades before the Reformation. I'll just show you some details of uh, this hellish scene. You can see a demon on the right there uh, bellowing fire, um, which souls can actually be seen coming out of that fire, or perhaps even going into his mouth. There's another face on this demon's belly. This is really nightmarish stuff, and there's souls being carted off in wheelbarrows by other demons on the left there and more souls being slung about and beaten. This is really rather graphic, gruesome stuff and definitely a reminder of how you want to not end up going here. And ultimately that's really what the parish church um, is all about. But back to Fairford's glass, which really is, is rather uh, an amazing survival as I indicated. This is an image of the Assumption of the Virgin Mary from one of the windows there. Very rare, again, um, that it survives. It's the crowning of the Virgin Mary, which it's, it's rare that it survives, I should explain, because the Reformation, only a couple of decades after these windows uh, were installed, was in full swing. And in the 1520s and 30s came the first wave of iconoclastic attacks. The first wave of attacks in the 1520s and 30s mostly concentrated on sculptural images and crucifixes. Um, the late 1530s, during the dissolution of the, the monasteries, um, caused a lot of loss to stained glass, and we know very little about the stained glass of monastic churches. But actually, most of the stained glass in parish churches seems to have been destroyed during the Reformation under Edward VI reign, not Henry VIII. So 1547, the boy king Edward VI came to the throne and he actually passed an, uh, a new injunction which specifically said to remove and destroy all images and monuments that are accessories to idolatry and encourage parishioners to do the same. And this really was the period in which um, parish uh, communities took it upon themselves uh, to, to actually destroy some of the, the figures and certain attacks on figures and other images like the Trinity were the most uh, common. So the scheme at Fairford is a, a very rare survival because most medieval windows, if you come across a parish church, might look more like this today. You can see 
uh, there's fragments which have been pieced back together very cleverly um, in the 19th century to indicate where the figures were, what has been lost and what has been um, survived. And you have to go with your binoculars and your uh, eyes looking very carefully to try and piece some of the fragments back together and work out what these windows once looked like. So that's a whiz through um, up to the, the Reformation. And next week, if you're uh, here, we will pick up um, from the post-Reformation right up to the present day. So it will be another gallop of some fantastic examples of stained glass in our English parish churches. And before I hand back to George, I should say if any of this has piqued your interest, as well as going to visit the parish churches uh, around you um, that are now opening um, up, please do come and visit the Stained Glass Museum as well if you're, if you're this way. We are open reduced hours during August, but delighted to be welcoming visitors again. Uh, do put it on your list to visit because we've got an incredible collection of stained glass from the 13th century to the present day, and you can get right up close to it. Um, the last five months we've been closed and it's been a real challenge for us as an independent museum. Our funding comes entirely from visitors. So if you can't visit, perhaps consider making a donation through our website as, as well as supporting the Church's Conservation Trust. Um, and the website is there for you, www.stainedglassmuseum.com. Thank you, George. Thank you ever so much for that, Jasmine. That was absolutely fascinating. And judging by the comments that are coming through on Facebook, people have really enjoyed your lecture. So thank you so much. And everyone, um, do also check out um, the Stained Glass Museum social media accounts. Um, if you look at our um, the text for today's talk, um, I think we've linked in the Stained Glass Museum. Um, so do have a look at that. Um, and also, um, one of the things that we should have said is that if you love these stained glass windows, um, we have some kind of church conservation trust called Champing, which allows you to spend the night in a historic church. And so you can actually sleep in them, um, wake up in them as the sun rises or sets. And the effects through these wonderful stained glass windows is amazing. So do look at um, champing.co.uk um, and do check out Champing on social media because um, we're now taking bookings um, for this unique experience. But we're now going into question time and there's all been lots of questions coming in so do um, keep commenting away and also do let us know if this is your first time joining our lecture today because we'd love to hear from you and um, hear your um, experience. So Jasmine, I'm going to dive straight in. Um, so first question, is there an aesthetic or commercial historical reason for painted versus coloured glass? No, that's a, that's a difficult question to answer um, because most stained glass windows, if they've got uh, images or they're telling stories, have paint on. It's the paint that gives it the detail. Um, however, you will go into parish churches and see that sometimes there are decorative windows which um, just use a kind of an, a, a tint of a colour um, and lead. Of course, they would have been cheaper to make because they don't involve the glass painter painting on the glass. So, so yes, there are some economic considerations there, um, but the, the most expensive traditional stained glass um, that certainly shows pictures and imagery tends to be painted. And on that stained glass, um, you, you talked earlier about Jarrow. Is Jarrow the earliest um, example in England of ecclesiastical stained glass? Yeah, the first example that we um, have discovered of, of window glass being found um, that, that we know was w used in the windows. And actually the evidence there is, is also uh, textual. Uh, we know that the, the bishop actually brought over artists from Northern Europe to show the English how to make this coloured glass. And you, you, you really showed a really fascinating, um, ex or gave a fascinating expression of how glass is produced, um, the leading process and how it's sort of fitted into tracery. How is it actually secured in place against stone? Is it cemented in or is it glued in? How, what, do they, what do they do? So there's a very good question. Um, there is usually a groove within the stonework and a wooden or metal frame that holds each of the panels together. So um, a window is made of many different panels and the, the metal framework is very important and uh, there are bars that often run across if you look in a church and the panels are tied to the bars using solder and wire. Thank you, gentlemen. That was a fascinating question, so thank you and keep them coming. Um, 
when the an incumbent or a donor wants to put glass in, um, did they need special permission for those windows to go in or was it really whoever had the most money got to do what they wanted? I think it's probably a mix of both, but certainly nowadays there are much more rigorous procedures to, to jump through, even if you are a, a wealthy and important individual. Um, I think back in the medieval period, it was much more in the hands of the, the priests and the, the lords of the manor. Thank you, Jasmine. And how did it work? Um, were there prominent artists who drew um, and sort of glass blows? We know when we look at cathedrals that were built, there are often tradesmen who would wander from job to job, certainly like stonemasons. Was it the same for glaciers? Did they wander from job to job? Or were there established sort of workshops um, across the country that produced glass? There were certainly established workshops. Um, we don't know as much as we'd like to about them, but that we do know a few named individuals and through stylistic analysis and records that survive, we've been able to, to work out that there were glass studios working in, in kind of key areas in, in medieval England. So around York, around Norwich, but also around places like Kings Lynn um, and uh, Exeter. And, I mean, anywhere where there's quite a lot of medieval buildings, there probably would have been a kind of local studio. However, the, the most expensive artists would have moved around. And we know that people came over from abroad and people like John Thornton of Coventry, example, were, were called up at York Minster to, to do the glass there. So there was some traveling involved and international as well. And was that international, that sort of English glass was going abroad or was it really we were importing glass, do you think? Well, interestingly, the, the, the actual coloured glass, we don't have any evidence for coloured glass being made in England in the medieval period. So it's actually thought that all of the coloured sheet glass was purchased from the continent. And certainly late medieval period, the continental artists were really leading the way, so much so that the London Glaziers Company uh, passed a law that basically said they could only have English apprentices. because They were very worried about these foreigners who were making uh, better glass and getting the good commissions. Right, well, that's fascinating to know about the trade and how far that goes back that we've been sort of, you know, importing these really important and precious objects um, into the country. Um, we often hear, and we, you've touched on it in your talk there, about the deliberate destruction of glass during the Reformation or certainly in the Civil War as well. Um, do you think also that a lot of glass has been lost just because um, churches haven't been looked after and lead has degraded so glass has fallen out and smashed? Absolutely, and we'll probably pick up more on that um, next week. I think there's a tendency that we have when we see the loss of glass to assume reformation. Um, that is certainly not the case. There were other political events like the Civil War that we'll, we'll talk about. Um, and also, yes, the general neglect in the post-reformation era of some of the churches meant that uh, winds and gales did blow through, windows were broken and not repaired, um, the glass wasn't valued or appreciated in the same way. So neglect, I'm afraid, is part of that, that history as well. And it's very important today for those in, in charge of parish churches to, to make sure that we are looking after these wonderful examples of our heritage. And that's what I know the Churches Conservation Trust and the Stained Glass Museum are, are also here for to, to try and preserve that. Well, as Jasmine said, everyone, do join us next week for part two. Um, I've got three more questions, um, if that's OK, Jasmine. So um, thanks for everyone for the questions. If we haven't answered them, um, we'll try our best to come back to you on Facebook. Um, did medieval clerics go around their churches and tell their congregations what was depicted in the glass? Or do you think it was um, quite self-explanatory? Um, I think... We've just lost Jasmine there, so um, I'm sorry to have... Oh, no, Jasmine's come back. <laughs> sorry, you, yes, uh, internet connections. I, I didn't quite catch that, George. Do you want to ask again? Yeah, um, so did medieval clerics go round their churches and tell their congregations about what the glass depicted? I think in the churches that would have had a lot of pilgrims, there would have been. Certainly we know that happened in the big cathedrals um, that were monasteries. So at Canterbury Cathedral, for example, um, the amazing Beckett windows that told the story of Thomas Beckett, pilgrims would have been explained the stories and the miracles in the windows. So I think that probably did happen just as it, as it does now when you, you go to a church and, and if there's someone there who's local, they'll, they'll tell you what they know. I think that's part of our kind of tradition.
I think that's really, really impressive that people, you know, do go to this and there's always been people there um, who have loved their parish church and wanted to show off what the special assets were. So that's really great to hear that. I think this is a really interesting question to finish on. Um, we've talked about um, Jarrow and sort of how we can, we've dated it. How, how can we actually date stained glass? What's the technique? Oh, sorry, everyone. I think. Okay, how, can we, how can we date it? Yeah. Yeah, I often get asked. There, there is a, there isn't a kind of simple sort of simple answer to that. I mean, um, certain techniques were obviously developed at certain periods. So anything that has silver stain on, we know is early 14th century or later. It was only made then. Um, and our art historians like um, myself and, and others will use our eyes because we we know what 14th century glass looks like but yes you can tell from the techniques from the colors used from the kind of design style uh, the, the the window itself really um but it is something that you you build up the more you look the more you understand there isn't an easy go-to i'm afraid for for that yeah. because of course artists have always um carried on making things in styles that are older than you know we don't all work in the, the fresh contemporary new style so sometimes something can can look older than it is and we'll see examples of that next week when we look at 19th century glass well you've heard it there um join us um next week um for part two um there is a link to part two um the event page um, for part two in this description so do click on that do um sign up and you'll get a prompt from facebook um also um just to say again thank you to jasmine for joining us um today that's been really great and thank you to everyone who has joined us today it's been wonderful um, to have your questions we look forward um, to respond to comments so do keep your comments coming in and we'll try and get back to you but as we said at the start of this lecture please do consider making a donation to our work um, we you know your donations really do help us to care for our 356 historic churches so do use your mobile phone do text cct to 70331 to give us a gift of three pounds or do click on the link to take offer or to take up our special offer for membership um, but if you've got any questions do send us a direct message but we look forward to joining you um, or for you joining us next week um, but take care and have a good week and we look forward to seeing you next week